Hello, More Than Worker. Um, I don't know if that's going to work as a name for listeners to this podcast, but I thought I'd try it out. Uh, Before I get into the interview part of this week, I just wanted to kind of set it up. I'll probably do the same next week. So the next two interviews were recorded two days after the election day in the United States. And I've been in London for this entire year, basically right before COVID I got here. So like you, I've been in lockdown. I've been alone in a studio flat for most of the time. And I can tell you that as an American being over here during this time and me being someone who's pretty politically active, it was a struggle. It, it, it was really hard. It was hard on this day. This interview that's coming up is with someone I used to work with in New York, and you'll hear a little bit about that. And we talk right at the beginning about not knowing what, what the results were. And we know now. And we know that President like Joe Biden and Vice President like Kamala Harris are preparing to take office in January. And I'll be honest with you, I've been struggling because I didn't get that overwhelming happiness I thought I was supposed to feel, and I still don't have it. I've got more relief and more anxiety than normal. And this interview, I think what's nice about it and why I'm posting it this week is that it's pretty light with someone who just likes their job. And they are a family man and they just talk really positively about their family, about being a dad, and about being a product manager. I think that it's just a light interview to listen to, and I hope you enjoy it. I enjoyed recording it with Jeff, the guest. Next week's going to be a little heavier, but very inspiring, it's with someone from Two Right Love on her arms. and They're an organization that's been very important to me over the last, I figured out, 14 years. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this one. I hope you find it light. I hope you get some good parenting advice for those of you who are parents. And just thanks for continuing to listen. Welcome to More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is defined by more than your job title. I'm Rabia, an IT project manager, comedian, nonprofit volunteer, and sometimes activist. Every week, I'll chat with a guest about pursuing passions outside of work or creating meaningful opportunities inside the workplace. As you listen, I hope you'll be inspired to do the same. So I worked with our guest this week. Welcome back, by the way. I worked with our guest this week um, a long time ago when I was in New York at a black car service that was not Uber. So that's why we're both still working. But he also just does really cool stuff with product management and with products he creates. And that's why he's here. I'm talking to someone who loves what they do this week, which should be fun for those of you who've been listening and kind of love what you do and feel a little left out of that one. So uh, Jeff Novich, uh, Principal Product Manager at ClassPass and the creator of the reported app in New York City. How's it going, Jeff? Hey, Robbie. It's good to see you. <laughs> good to see you, too. And not everyone can see us, but... We can see each other at least, which is nice. Good to chat. Yeah, it's a tough, uh, you know, it's a tough time right now. We're awaiting the election results, as you know. So this is a very distracting week for all of us, I think. We're recording this on November 5th, which means we are both aware of what our states have done, because I voted for California from London and Jeff in New York, but we don't know where other states are. So that's kind of... um, Tough. And Jeff, you probably appreciate all the work that's gone into building all these interactive maps <laughs> that everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to just introduce yourself to everyone listening? Yeah, I'm Jeff, Jeff Novich. Um, I am, a, as, as Ravi said, uh, I'm a product manager at ClassPass. I've been there for five and a half years. So talk about, you know, a tenure. Um, before that, I worked with Ravia at a car service company. I was a mobile product manager there. That was back in 2012. And uh, yeah, on the side, I love uh, developing you know, other ideas. Um, and I built an app called Reported, which allows you to quickly snap a picture of a car in a bike lane, which is, happens all the time here in New York City. And uh, it submits it to 311. Uh, so I'm also a cycling advocate, um, and I have two kids, which 
and a family, which keeps me uh, very occupied these past <laughs> number of years. So I haven't been doing as much side project ideas as I normally would have, but um, I say that my kids are like my startup now. So <laughs> I invest a lot of time and energy in them. I can imagine, especially right now. I mean, I'm in a studio and it's just me and I'm going a little bit nuts sometimes. So <laughs> having several people in an apartment uh, <laughs> sounds like a project. It's been a, it's been a challenge and an adventure and there are pros and cons, but you know, these past seven, eight, however many months, 10 years uh, <laughs> in quarantine and a two bedroom in New York city with two children and two working parents, full-time working parents with no help from anybody uh, like no nanny, no grandparents or anything uh, has been a challenge, but you know, we've experienced a lot of really great milestones with our kids also. So there's, you know, it's not, it's not all uh, noise and chaos, but uh, most of the time, that's that's what it is. Most of the time, it's distractions. <laughs> yeah, I have a few friends who are in a similar boat, and it's it's been interesting to talk to them. Sometimes to talk to the kids too during their day, because I'm like at night over here, so I can talk to I can talk to children in, in the states during their day. Um, my niece and nephews. So yeah, so kudos to you on getting through this and having a smile on your face while you're doing it. Um, So like we were, like I said, and you said we worked together in New York and at the time I was new to product management and I was working on the website and you were working on the mobile app and I had a ton to learn at that time, but I knew I liked product and now I'm a project manager, which wasn't my passion, Um, but you've stayed with product. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess, um, Yes, you should maybe even, you may not even realize what led me to Groundlink in the first place. So when we first met, that was my first actual job, like getting paid a paycheck and being told, you know, being expected to show up to work 40 hours a week. Before that, leading up to that, I had vowed never to take a full-time job. So my experience is probably flipped from what I think you're, you're talking about, like where with like career changes and stuff where I was committed for like 10 years leading up to, or maybe not 10, but leading up to Groundlink to never work for anybody. I was like, I don't want a boss. I'm going to be really stubborn. I have all these startup ideas. I'm going to work on all this stuff. And my wife was very supportive for many years. And then after many more years was like, yeah, so like, what's the deal here? Uh, Are you just going to work on these like failed startups for like forever? Or, and, and her thing was basically, she made a really good, Point. She was like, look, you can build a startup. You can have your ideas and just work with awesome people at a company and get paid to do it. And I was like, no, it has to be my idea. And she was like, yeah, but you can just have your ideas at another company um, and build cool stuff. And uh, and also she was like, mm, you have to do this. Otherwise, we're not going to have children because we need, <laughs> we need money. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so that was the requirement. It was literally one requirement. It was just get a job. And uh, thank God, because it was the greatest change. So that was a bit, that was a massive career change. You may not have realized this. So when I, when I um, first was interviewing and then I got, I got the role as a mobile product manager, that was my first real role as a, like a full-time product manager. I had been doing a lot of that kind of stuff, but it was very uh, non-traditional leading up. And, um, and then since then I, I just got hooked and I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm, this is my love is working on products, building experiences, whether it's mobile or web, um, and working with people like you, you know, like we, you and me, and I think one or two other people were sitting, were sitting for like, you know, a year in like a small room yeah. um, overlooking like what 37th street or something. It was like pre, pre 2020 lockdown, yeah. eight hours in, a day. <laughs> in uh, 20, yeah, 2012, 2012, yeah. 2013. And, uh, and, you know, that was an interesting experience. The first day that I rolled in, our CEO was fired <laughs> that afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and then my last day, we were all laid off because it was, or I was laid off. It was, uh, you know, a bunch of people were laid off. Yeah. And, was- um, but I had such a great experience. Those 10 months were fantastic because I, I had such a joy working with everybody and getting all that experience. And I was like, I just love this. I, you know, I, I really had nothing but good things uh, to say about the company and the people. So, and then I stuck with it and I stuck with product management. That's, which is awesome. And so you're at ClassPass now. So 
that's pretty cool. And I think just the fact that you're a fitness person for sure. I mean, as long as I've known you and we follow each other on Strava now, so <laughs> we know, you know, that you're doing a little more activity than me, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I see you, I see you biking. I, I, it's like, I'm on a treadmill around Regent's park. I see you cocking. And I, I love seeing on Strava, like the locations. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah. Where, where is, Oh yeah. You're in London. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah so it's different, different big park to go around. Like you have your park. I have mine. Yeah. But, um, how do you, like, how'd you end up at class pass and were you trying to look for a role in that kind of industry? Um, it wasn't actually, actually, it's funny, you know, I was interviewing back in 20, early 2015. And at that point I was, um, I had, um, two sort of roles under my belt. And at that point I had honed kind of what I was looking for a little bit. Like I knew I really wanted to work with a really strong engineering team that was, um, building something cool. I knew that I wanted to work at a company that was a startup that was small enough, but growing and had really good growth prospects coming from the two prior companies that where I was basically, you know, uh, as they say in London made redundant, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, at the, you know, and, and, and only good things to say because I had great experiences, but I was like, I want to be somewhere. I want to be on a rocket ship, you know, and I want to have a, a I want to have a seat there. I don't care if it's in the back of the back row. I just want to experience what that's like. And at the time, ClassPass had just raised $40 million. Um, at the time, I also was like, oh, this is like a yoga, uh, you know, this is like yoga for women. This isn't really like, I don't know what my place here. Like, I don't know if I would use the product. I, I didn't. I didn't do studio uh, workouts at the time at all. So I literally had no idea and uh, didn't even think I was going to use it. But I met the product team and the engineering team and got hooked. And I was like, this is this is a team that I'm, I just I believe in. I'm going to learn a ton from them. And this is going to be a, a like a really exciting opportunity that doesn't come that frequently. So uh, let me jump in. But, you know, I'm just going to get get my seat, like, you know, mm -hmm. in and then like be a part of this. And, you know, and then a month later, I think I took my first studio fitness class. So now I'm up to like, I don't know, 400 or 500, which is great. I mean, it only took me yeah. five years, but, and now all the gyms are closed in New York or, you know, mostly closed, but uh, I love it. I became, I became hooked and it became like my whole kind of, um, you know, working out uh, became a big part of it. But the product side has been really exciting um, at ClassPass all these years and continues to be. I know a couple people who use it and they really love it. And is there any feature that you can talk about that you was like an idea, kind of like your wife had told you, you know, you can build your ideas with the team. Did you have anything that you're particularly proud of? Yeah. I mean, when I started, I was working on the, um, the, uh, the, what we call the, the partner dashboard of class So that's, you know, we work with gyms. We work at 35, 45, I think over 35,000 mm -hmm. studio gym partners um, and wellness partners all, all around the country, all around the world. Um, and at the time when I joined, there was basically no website that they used. Like they needed to log in and see, you know, what their reservations are, how much money they're making um, and, and a variety of other things. They, they couldn't manage anything. So when I joined, there was basically nothing. Um, and I had to go from like zero to one, which is very much like a startup kind of yeah. concept. And I think like those first three months, I was like, you know, it was a, the first day was like a, a week had gone by and it was just the end of the day. And uh, those first couple of months, we were, I was just writing tickets and shipping just a ton. It was just putting out tons of fires. So I don't know if there's like a specific feature that's particularly interesting to your audience. I mean, but it's, it's sort of the, the uh, projects that are related to, um, you know, to, to what gyms and, and partners um, would log in and expect. So one thing that didn't exist was like, you know, we work with um, the spots that you would give us in a class, right? So if you have a yoga class, there's 12 mats, maybe three of them you want to provide, you know, you, you are excess that you're not really going to fill. So you, you give them the class pass and we fill them. But there was no way for them, for partners to manage the number of spots that they were giving us. They literally would email account managers and like do it all manually. It was, it was crazy. And at the time there were only a few thousand partners, but it was still overwhelming. And, um, and so that was like my first major project, which I'm still like, you know, it's, it's funny five years later, 
you still see vestiges of the the first version of that in the dashboard today, which is which is sort of turned over many times and has been reimagined. But I'm like really proud of that. Uh, you know, we call it spot spot management. You know, um, but uh, it's a pretty it's it's a pretty mundane kind of boring thing I think probably to talk about. But like internally, it allowed me to learn so much about so many aspects of the company. Right, like internally just technically mm-hmm. how things work like how do you actually set this stuff internally um how partners like how gyms like how your end users even think about using how they interact with the website like how do you portray this stuff it's not like a text box you know mm-hmm. it needs to you need to give kind of the right context and the right nudges and a lot of these customer uh, uh you know user experience um aspects that allowed me to sort of jump right into this this role so that was that was really fun yeah, no, I think that's cool. And I don't I don't think it's uninteresting, really, because I think one thing a lot of people who aren't in any aspect of software development, one thing they don't know is even to have a really bad user experience on a website, and I'm going to call one out, paying your bill on Macy's is like one of the worst experiences you could ever have. It's something, you know, my mom will even say now, oh, this is a very bad user experience. <laughs> But it's so important and it doesn't matter what the feature is. And I think that's the interesting thing to me is how someone like you will go and approach that kind of problem. And just like now my role is more project management, but I get to beat up on designs every once in a while, which is the best part. And that's, you know, because you can say, hey, that's not going to work very well for that. (laughs) These people, you know, so I think it's pretty cool. So when you look at user experience, though, for the app you created reported, let's get into that. How did you even start? How did you start with creating the app? And then how did you kind of figure out how to make the experience good? Because it's for people who are on a bike. Yeah, I mean, it didn't start that way. So for, for your for your audience, Reported is, is an app, like I said, it's, it's an app that now allows you to really easily report cars and bike lanes, right? So it's all about driver accountability, reckless kind of endangerment of cyclists and, and pedestrians. And, you know, like um, you can post things about illegal parking and they go to 311. This isn't like they go into the void and you're just sort of complaining on Twitter. Twitter is sort of useless. This actually goes to 311 and agencies actually deal with that. Um, in this case, like the Taxi Limousine Commission handles like Ubers and things like that. And they can issue a summons and a summons is real is a fine. You know, you're talking about like I can take a picture and I have control and then a driver gets a $50 fine from the TLC. That's pretty that's substantial. That accountability didn't start that way. It started when you and I were at work. And um, and at the time I was living um, uh, in at Frederick Douglass Circle, which for your your listeners is at the, the northwest corner of Central Park in New York City. And it's a very, very loud uh, place. It's a, there's a confluence of, there was a gas station there that serviced a lot of black cars, which were probably half of them were working at Groundlink. And, uh, you know, yellow taxis, green taxis, buses would come through, trucks would come through. It was very, very noisy. And these taxis would honk incessantly because it was a gas station at a roundabout with a light, which means that it would turn red and it would be trying to make a right turn and everything would stop traffic or whatever. And at the time, I was like, God, what do I do about this? So I called 311 and, and then, you know, they were like, well, you could file a complaint. So one thing led to another. I quickly learned that, oh, you can file complaints. And then they actually have some, you know, some, some kind of tangible, um, you know, accountability that comes along with it. And one thing led to another. I made a spreadsheet. I tracked like 10 submissions that I did. And I think one of the key kind of insights for product management is learning the whole flow. Like what does this process actually look like? Um, what does it currently work? How does it currently work? What is the most manual crappy way to do this? It's tedious. And it is me, you know, filing complaints manually. And I think from that, that insight is what led me to say, you know what? I can automate all these steps. I can automatically like all the information you need is maybe take a picture and, um, and then I can automatically submit that to 311 through their website on your behalf and then sort of track that through the system. And um, and then, you know, that that's kind of what led to uh, I worked with a, a buddy of mine. He built the iOS app. And I built sort of the back end for it that actually did the processing. 
And um, we just sort of designed a pretty basic like flow, like a user experience. And um, and what was funny is I I was totally convinced. I was like, everybody's going to use this to file complaints about taxis honking. Honking bothers everybody. Yeah. And I am clearly the only like grumpy old man in New York uh, who like is most bothered by this stuff <laughs> because nobody actually used it for honking complaints, but cyclists started using it and um, they started using it to submit complaints about taxis and bike lanes. And at the time I wasn't biking. I, I had never biked in New York. I was terrified of it, but I started to realize that. And I think, again, as a product manager, you when you're working on a startup, it's like zero to one and you're first putting something into the world and you're seeing how people respond to it. I think one of the valuable things here is you 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 want to pay very close attention to those early users. Right. Those early users define the nature of your product in a lot of ways, you know, just like the early employees will define your culture at your at your company. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the early users were these cyclists who were very like intensely, uh, you know, focused on clearing bike lanes. And I was like, I don't really understand this use case. And then once I started paying closer attention to biking, then everything flipped. And then that's where the user experience really came from. I was like, this user experience has to work for somebody who's on a bike and you're approaching a car that is blocking you. It needs to be like a New York minute. You know, you cannot spend more than 10 seconds on this. Nobody's going to waste their time on this. You have you have that window of opportunity where a New Yorker is like in rage and angry for like 10 seconds until they're past it. And then they're like, eh, no big deal. I'm not going to deal with that anymore. You know, you, you know, you come across this kind of stuff all the time. If, you know, and you don't really take that rage with you wherever you go. You're just like this car is in the bike lane. Yeah. I'm going to take a picture of it and report it. And uh and that's where the that's where the UX came from. That's great. And I was I was riding my bike at that time in New York, and you were right to be scared because I definitely I hit a cab once. One time I flew off my bike in Central Park, like because I was avoiding being hit, tore my MCL. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So I wish I would have had an app just to even report just my recklessness. Maybe. Oh, like, and you were that was in Central Park. Yeah, and I probably should have just you know, been able to like do something to track all the crazy stuff I was doing. So I'd maybe think twice before getting on my bike some days, <laughs> but it's like, it was crazy. So I, w when I saw like this evolve just on your posts online, it was interesting. Cause even now in London uh, today, I was laughing at something, some stat you had that um, the fine for a driver who honks when there's no emergency is a hundred dollars. I don't know if that's still the, the going rate, but at the time you wrote that it was and uh the cost of it here in london is you get called a four-letter word that's not very popular in the states by a cyclist you honk at because i saw it happen today and there was this woman passing me and this guy honked and she almost like turned into me because it was really loud and then she just yells this word that was quite you know still colorful to me just because i'm pretty new here <laughs> And I wish we could report that because it was bad. I mean, and it's pretty brutal sometimes. Like a lot of the cabs will try to hit you here, you know, as a cyclist. So, well, you, there's one thing you should be aware of, which, which is that London has a citizen, a very, very strong citizen complaint law that allows you to file reckless as a citizen. You can file a reckless driving complaint against any driver, not just like taxis. Um, you become a witness. You you become it becomes like a law, like a like a very minor like lawsuit. But you are you attest that you witnessed something, you experienced something, and you're willing to um, you know go to a hearing over it. And that's what I actually you know it's funny that's that's what I'm trying to get a city the city council here in New York to to uh, to update our bill to, to to have a bill that allows any citizen to file any com a complaint around reckless driving and illegal parking so that it's not just the NYPD that can do it. And it's not just the tax limousine commission that can, that has that authority that there's an authority in between, but you know, but that's what I'm saying. Like when I, you know, doing the product manager, you're not, you know, in, in this case, this is very interesting because I was building, you know, the whole, the nature of this whole app and the whole experience is all like around an existing 
formal flow that is the 311 mm-hmm. system, right? Like without that, I don't really have anything. But so you have to understand it really, really clearly and know like the 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 ins and outs of of uh, you know what your city can and cannot do and what they you know what they actually do. Um, we're not building like Twitter, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a fun online thing that you just like report stuff and then take pictures and that's it. Like it actually hits a real world, you know, government system, which means yeah. that's a whole other mess that is, I think, exciting and mind numbing at the same time. Cause it's, it's the city. So you're dealing with their websites and their like crazy kind of complexity. And one thing that I like that you do is you tend to post your stats every year, just kind of general Jeff stats, but then also about reported. So, <laughs> so how, how has the usership grown from when you started to now? Yeah. Um, I think, so it, it, I think we officially like launched in 2014. Um, and then basically there was like, you know, 20 people using it for the year and, you know, it's not like I, you know, this wasn't like a formal startup or anything. There was no money behind it. There was no, I didn't, I don't even, there's no business model. It's a side project. It is very much like a a passion project that I do explicitly. Like that's, that's some people were asking like, why don't you do a GoFundMe or why don't you get some, and I'm like, that would change the nature of this whole project. You know, it's not really a startup. So over the, I think 20, I, I don't even know, like not a lot of people were using it. It was like 20 people, 30 people for the year, you know, there's very minimal use. And then 2018, I think there were a few, you know, maybe a few thousand submissions for the year. And then 2019, so last year, it it really blew up. And what's really depressing about that is that it pretty much exploded because of all the cyclist deaths. And that's the saddest part of this whole thing is I, I wish this app didn't exist. I wish I wish the complaints were going down because the bike lanes were all clear. And then we just literally, I would like the the app to not even be in existence. You know, mm-hmm. that's the, that's the weird kind of goal is like, I don't want users. I don't want really any of this. What's sad is 2019 was the deadliest year for cyclists. 29 cyclists were killed um, by drivers. And, uh, and that over the summer really like peaked and there was a lot of interest um, and last year there were, I don't know, 900 in, in, in unique individuals who submitted at least one complaint. There were about 18,000 submissions, which doesn't sound like a lot. Like when you think of an app and it's like, whatever, like you're like, yeah, 18,000, I don't know. There, shouldn't there be a million or something like that? <laughs> but the crazy thing is that represents, I think, I forgot what my number was, like a half or a third of all of the TLC consumer complaints. Wow. Came through reported. That's, that's, a, that's a, 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 like a very, very high percent. I knew it was a high percent back in 2017, 2018, it was creeping up. But then in 2019, when I ran the numbers, um, it was, you know, it's like half of all their prosecutions are through reported. Um, wow. You know, they're, they're individuals like you and me who might see something and then you take a picture, but they're very, um, they're very, very strong because the evidence is very strong. You have a photo, you have a documented, you know, lap, like a, a location time, you have the person's name and information, you have very explicit language in the description that, that clarifies it. And um, yeah, but I don't know. My hope is that the, the behavior is changing for, for drivers, but it's really hard to say. We are on track. I mean, just for New York City right now, we're, we're at 20 cyclist deaths already. So we are on track for being also one of the deadliest years, you know, in the last 20 years. So, and this year when really, I mean, I don't know how it is there right now, but I mean, there are less cars on the road here for sure. We just went into lockdown again today. So it was remarkably less cars when I took my ride today than say three days ago when it was, you know, everything was booming still. So that's kind of scary too, just the fact that, I mean, it's probably less traffic in New York, I imagine. I don't know. In, yeah, no, that's, that's your 100. Yeah, that's, that's totally accurate is that there were absolutely fewer cars in, you know, April, May, June. Yeah. But that meant speeding was absolutely on the ride. Like the, the, the number of speeding tickets didn't actually really go down. That's the crazy thing is that you had a fraction of the traffic volume, but still a very high incidence of speeding. 
uh, cycling wasn't super, you know, was kind of came back once quarantine was lifted, right? Like, like people didn't have any place to go. So you didn't take a car or a bike. Right. But, um, but now you absolutely see, there's a, just a huge, uh, there's a boom in cycling, which is great. I think, um, I think it's tremendous. I mean, I think New York city could be re- like is on track to be a, a, a really amazing bike friendly city. Uh, I mean, London has done so much more in so much less time. Paris, you know, these other other places have just taken it so much more seriously. And uh, but but yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that we do a little a lot more, a lot faster. But we're 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 slow. Do you have any feedback from users other than the fact that they use it? Like anyone, a, something special that was said, or you know, some something you heard about anecdotally that you know it changed their experience riding a bike in new york or have you maybe not seen that yet that kind of thing uh no no i mean no i've talked to a lot of people i mean what's interesting is the 80 20 rule totally applies here so you have people who are intense and they post they will file just a crazy number of submissions (laughs) and they represent like the bulk of submissions are coming from like i've met i've met all these people and they are you know very friendly, very like they will take pictures of like everything and submit. They will, they have like thousands of complaints under their name. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, is it, I think, I think for the average cyclist, when you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm on a bike, but you know, then you start encountering this stuff. Everybody in New York, anybody who cycles in New York, like you immediately come to grips with the fact that we're a pretty hostile city and mm-hmm. cycling oh, infrastructure yeah. is pretty hit or miss and drivers are pretty uh, can often be pretty reckless and um, not pay attention or be actively like, you know, reckless against you. Um, uh, You know, at the, at the very least, like they just casually, Oh, I'm just going in for a second. So I'm just going to park here and uh, screw you. I don't really care. Go around. It's always just go around. Um, I think having this app, I think I've definitely heard people talk about the app as like this nice thing in their pocket that if, when something happens and they feel like, um, you know, justice should be served, but that's really not, that's a pretty loaded term. Probably don't want to talk about that, but you know, where they want, where they want some accountability because otherwise you're just cursing at the sky, you know, at the sky and yeah. in New York, like there's nothing you can do, but this allows you to, um, in those rare case, in those cases where it's really extreme or you're like, this is so egregious what I'm seeing here. It does allow people to, 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 um, you know, take a picture and, and hold those people accountable. And I think that's, that's, I don't know if there's like a phrase that, that has been said, but like, I've definitely heard that from a lot of people. I think that's how it spread. It's not like I was advertising or anything. People just gravitate and they're like, oh, this is what you use as a cyclist. This is the app that you would have in addition to like your city bike app and your city mapper app or your Google app, like to, for your directions and for like access to bikes and things like that. You also want to protect yourself. And this is sort of a form of protection because you know that you can use it in, in, if you need to. Yeah. No, I mean, that's really cool. And it's just, it's nice that as a passion project, you've been able to do something to just help people, which is pretty cool because not everyone has maybe, well, there's a lot goes into it. I think you have to have the wherewithal to stick with it, you know, cause it's frustrating or hard to build things, uh, as we both know, that's why, that's why there are bugs and, you know, but also just to, yeah, just see it through and say at, at first. And I think that's one thing that people don't realize is like your whole thing about talking from zero to one, going from zero to one. That's a hard part because you don't know if things are going to work and you don't know if people even want them necessarily. You think they do but it's just being able to learn and be open to learning during that time. I think that's like pretty cool. And I saw you doing that when we worked together a long time ago and just being curious and asking questions and stuff like that. Cause we all go in with a bunch of assumptions, <laughs> but you know, we need to get the questions answered basically. Yeah. I think that's, you know, user research is great and getting to know, who, you know, your users basically. So I think, yeah, when we were working, I was like, well, I just want to talk to a couple of these people. Um, and same thing here. I mean, I personally know many of the users of reported, like I know them because right. 
we we, tra we travel in the same circles of Twitter, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, but they're they're fierce, and I think they um, they help shape it, right? Um, um, and that passion, like you can't th that it's it's awesome. It's awesome to see, like, oh, I'm building something that like is giving these people like the ability to do something that they might otherwise not necessarily do, or if they did it otherwise, they would have to do a lot more take a lot more effort, you know, there'd be a lot, a lot more friction. Um, and, uh, and so I talked to them and they're like, you know, they give ideas and, and, uh, tell me everything that's wrong. <laughs> like we don't have any money and I don't only have uh, volunteer people helping with the app and, uh, they have other things on their minds. So we're not going to ship any releases anytime soon. <laughs> um, I'm actually, no, I mean, the idea that I have now is just to get rid of the app completely and focus on sort of the power user entirely where I would say, all right, you know, when you think of the user experience, I want to be able to ride a bike and just literally take pictures along the way. That's, that's kind of the yeah. bare minimum, the, the zero friction kind of op option. Um, but then what do you do with those photos? The problem is with the app, you then have to go spend time afterwards and like upload the photos and identify the license plates and do all this additional work. And I'm like, I wrote this whole script that can automate almost all of that, virtually all of it pretty like well enough that if you have a picture, it'll automatically identify the license plate. It'll scrape the lat long and the location, the metadata from the photo. So you have the time, the timestamp, all that. If you basically are saying, look, I'm only doing bike lane complaints from, you know, for my ride. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I, I'm imagining this kind of flow where I was test, I was just playing around with it. I think, I don't know if you saw my latest blog post where I was sort of uh, came up with this kind of script, but where you give some of these users like a Dropbox account, a uh, Dropbox like folder, and they would just take pictures, throw a hundred photos into that. Uh, we all like, it's funny, by the way, when, when I talk to other people about this, all of them have their phones and you see their photo feeds are basically in their photo album is like all just uh, what my friend calls car butts. Like it's just <laughs> the back of cars. Cause that's like, you're constantly taking pictures. And uh, you know, in that moment you're like, ah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to file complaints. So um, but just taking that and being able to quickly say, here's 100 photos, throw them all in the Dropbox, and then my script would just automatically do the best it can and file them immediately with no, with nothing in between. Um, because we know, we already know the information about your user account and like who you are. And we know the type of complaint this is, so we don't have to like classify anything. The only sort of unknown is the license plates, but that can be um, automatically uh, evaluated from, you know, these third party systems. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. And just make it more efficient. That's like giving, giving the users something they maybe didn't even know they needed and, or some of them might probably maybe told you they needed that, but that's pretty, that's pretty cool. So one thing with just you also, and just being passionate about things, I would say, I don't know if you call yourself a writer. I would say you're a bit of a writer. One of the things that I was most entertained by and informed by was like, you did a review of Soylent, for example, right? <laughs> where it was just, it was so detailed and it was so cool because I think everyone has that friend who has a spreadsheet for everything. Mm -hmm. I'm that friend for a lot of my friends. And then who has a friend who just gets super excited about things. So how do you decide to just, you're going to go deep dive into something like that? And I'll post the link to that. <laughs> to <your laughs> right so people can see, but how do you kind of like get motivated just to be really into a certain product and go for it? A product or or, or writing a writing a, a three thousand word uh, yeah blog post about the product. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for those who don't know, Soylent is a like drinkable uh, food that uh, kind of it's an unfortunate name, but I've been drink I've been consuming it. I don't know if you call it eating or drinking, but. Um, I've been consuming two thirds of my calories probably on a weekly basis uh, of, of Soylent for the past like six years <laughs> and I'm still here. So it's great. It's a great, like low cost, um, but high quality, I think pretty, pretty quality food. Um, but I had, but you know, when you talk about, Oh, I'm going to drink this, like I'm going to drink 400 calories for lunch, you know, no thanks team. I'm not going to go out to like sweet green or like, uh, you know, to get a burrito with you, I'm going to drink this beige, uh, <laughs> you know, 
uh, odorless, <laughs> tasteless liquid uh, for my meal. Um, I think it grosses a lot of people out. And so over the months that I was sort of ta- telling people about this, they uh, they had a lot of thoughts. Um, and so it was more like an FAQ. That's, that's kind of how I framed that blog post. I was like, well, these are things that I hear so much from people. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to sort of run the, the gamut of like, here are all the different kind of exclamations and complaints. And you have people that have very strong opinions. Um, and I wanted to sort of address each of them. So I, I penned this very long blog post that described kind of how I respond to all of those, um, all of those responses, you know, cause some people are like, Oh, gross. I'll never drink like food. And I'm like, yeah, but I mean, you would have a smoothie, you know, <laughs> uh, or they're like, it's, you know, it doesn't taste good. And I'm like, D- are, are all your meals like the greatest meals of, of your life? No, most, many of them, especially at lunch, like during the week are like crappy food. You're, you know, like a, like a, what's it called? Um, you know, Taco Bell or something. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. compare it to that. That's what you want to compare it to. So, and like cost, you know, it's cost, convenience and health, right? Or, or mm. how I, those are how I sort of broke it down. But yeah, I've done those kinds of blog posts. I, I love those. Uh, I did that on City Bike also. Mm-hmm. Through, like yeah. all the benefits of a City Bike commute, like why I loved it so much. I mean, it's really, it was really more a reflection on like biking in general. Um, yeah. But, you know, some of the benefits of City Bike and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I write a lot. I tend to not write frequently because I have kids now. And so I used to write a lot more blog posts and things. Um, but it's very, it helps me sort of organize all my thoughts um, in one place. Yeah, I think it's great. And I think it's just fun to, again, see someone who's just passionate about things and sharing information and, you know, just, yeah, really the whole sharing of information thing. I mean, that's something I've gotten better about and understood the value of more. I used to be one of those people who, if I had all the information, then I was the most valuable. But I think it's the opposite is true. If you're sharing information, then it's valuable. Information someone just holds to themselves is like not worth that much. <laughs> uh, so I have a um, like a series of questions that I like to ask that I call the fun five. Uh, before we get to that one, do you have any like advice or mantra that you'd like to just share with people that was either told to you a long time ago or just kind of what you try to live by? <laughs> in, like in general or like for product management? Or yeah, or product management or work or whatever, you know? I mean, you know, I think, well, I don't know, a couple, maybe like a couple things. I think having kids has changed, obviously, like, I think that's not a cliche to, to say that like when you, when you have children, it changes you, you know, you, you, so like really simple, basic examples is like, I need to be a role model for my kids. So, you know, I don't want to curse like my kids now, like, you know, my son now will look at me if I, even if I say like S H, if I even say like, if I spell it, you know, (laughs) he'll look at me and be like, daddy, uh, like, what are you doing? Those are, you know, those are bad. Um, so I think like my my mantra is just like, you know, imagine that your children are like watching you. Uh, so treat people with with respect and like that's kind of how you go about your day. Um, and that uh, I don't think that's a I think that's a good principle that you can kind of apply to most most things that you encounter in your life. Um, you know, I surely would have made different choices in my you know, like twenties, if I had that like responsibility and th- and was thinking in terms of like what you know what are the perspectives of other people because I think kids just help you have a very um, like uh, you always want to think of like be sensitive about other people's perspectives, but kids in particular like have no agenda or anything, so they are very um, you know they're sort of just naturally like a good. Um, like a like a good perspective to, to recognize and be sensitive to and be like, if I'm sarcastic, like sarcasm is a good example, like something I do not do anymore. I don't do it. It's a mean thing to do. You know, it's just it comes across as mean to children. And, uh, you know, so I, tr- I try to not do any of that. Like I don't do it to my coworkers. I don't do it to my wife. Like but that was something I, I would have done a lot, you know, um, 
things like that. Jokes that that where you are, you know, where you're kind of you're the expense of the joke. I mean, you're a comedian, you know, you, it, you know, you're talking to adults. It's different. But like, I think that's that's how I how I've approached a lot of things um, in the last, you know, six, seven years. Yeah. Well, and even with comedy, I mean, there's an idea that you don't punch down. And um, I just saw Ricky Gervais two nights ago, and he kind of takes has a go at people who say they don't punch down. But I think it is a matter of what you want the reflection of you to be and things you say and do. And I'm not, I was kind of laughing when you're saying about being sarcastic. Cause I'm like, Oh, I don't even know if I can talk. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's not like, don't ever do this. I'm just like, if, if you think about that and how, yeah. not that you should treat everybody like a child, but there's a great book that I highly recommend. It's called how to talk, how um, was it? How to talk to kids how to talk so kids will listen and how to listen so kids will talk. Mm. I may have yeah. flipped it. It's a book from like the early 80s where they basically, it's actually a good product product management book because it's it's a book that's written through all these uh, workshops that they did, that these two like authors who were sort of um, educators, they brought in all these parents and would do these workshops with them. And they had all, it's, it's tons of real world examples mm-hmm. where you're like, here's how, how do you get a kid who's like seven to like do something. Um, if a kid comes home and is like upset, how do you respond? Right. And that, like we read that um, when Jack was born, when my son was born and um, it is literally a how like the same, it's how to talk to your coworkers. It's how to talk to other adults. It's how to talk to your spouse or your, you know, your significant other. Yeah. with respect like it's literally it's a blueprint for all of that because it's the exact same model you you know if your kid comes back and is like uh jimmy you know call me a name today as a as an adult you immediately try to solve their problems right by being like well don't worry about it you're not really hurt or whatever right and you yeah. you give them feelings that, and instead of reflective listening like reflective listening is a big thing um and i learned like all these things that i realized like i did not have you know, <laughs> beforehand and uh, really internalized it. And I think that's all part of it is, um, I don't know. I don't know how helpful that is in no, general uh, as an answer to the question, but that is how I, like, that's how I try to uh, do the best I can with, you know, talking to anybody and interacting with people and thinking about, you know, the sensitivities of the world. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's great. All right. So for the fun five, uh, the first one, what's the oldest t-shirt you have and still wear? <laughs> and we're both wearing t-shirts, which people will see in our picture, but yeah. It's- I have a lot of startup shirts that I got for free. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, cause my wife has thrown out virtually anything that is like really old, <laughs> but probably like, I think like probably eight or eight, eight to 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, if it doesn't have sweat stains, uh, you know, armpit uh, stains or regular stains, which is rare now, you know, you can't, yeah. you, can't you can't have kids and not have uh, kind of stains and stuff. So, yeah, probably eight to 10 years. I think I have a digital New York T-shirt that I got maybe 20. Maybe not, that's not 10 years. That's like six years, 20, 2015, 2014. But some probably New York shirt. Or startup shirt. Uh, lots of yeah, lots of New York City uh, startup T-shirts. <laughs> yeah. All right. If every day was really Groundhog's Day, because a lot of people are calling days in 2020 Groundhog's Day, because <laughs> it seems like it is. Uh, what song would you have playing on your alarm every morning? <laughs> can I can I check my uh, Spotify? Of course. I could I could literally answer this because I could tell you what what am I listening to uh on repeat anyway. I like pink. Hey hey why well, miss you sometime. All right. That, that is a very, very catchy song that I could listen to every morning for the rest of my life. All right. I don't hopefully, get it. hopefully it's not the that long. <laughs> uh so coffee or tea or neither? Oh, like two to three cups of coffee. Great. Every okay. morning. I never had coffee until I had kids. I used to make fun of my wife and I said, oh, you got a coffee addiction. You can't, you you know, you have way too much coffee every morning ever since I met her. And then um, she's like, I can quit anytime I want, you know, but I just don't want to. I just, and I'm like, no, you're addicted. And then we had Jack and then literally on a dime, 
from that point on, uh, I had two to three cups of coffee every single morning without ever stopping. Yeah, it, I, I do it even without kids. Uh, do you remember the last time you like laughed so hard you cried or just couldn't stop laughing? I don't, but I think when my wife did, I remember that, and I think we were. I think it was. I think it was Storks. We were watching the movie Storks <laughs> like a couple of years ago, and she. It was like she was, you know, on. She was like hi the whole movie, but she wasn't. But she was just like cackling and could not control herself. So that's that's a good recommendation too. Then, um, and who inspires you right now? Well, I'll tell you who does. <laughs> Trump does not. Not at all. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, I think probably my wife. You know. Yeah. Um, most most days, right? She's she's juggling many different things all the time. So it's it's it is very inspiring to be a a mom in New York with a full-time job and two kids and, you know, living in quarantine, but I don't, yeah, that's kind of a cliche answer, but, but uh, it is, I think it is true. That's nice. All right. And is there anything you want to promote or want people to check out? Uh, you should follow um, my wife has a great Instagram account um, called cargo bike mama, cargo bike M O M M A. And uh, she has an, an awesome Dutch cargo bike. That's like a, an electric bike. Um, it looks kind of like a wheelbarrow in the front. It's really cool. Not yeah. a lot of people have it. And uh, she takes these awesome photos um, when she rides around town. So, Jeff, thanks so much for being on. I really appreciate it. And it was really nice chatting with you about reported and just all things product thank you thank you Robbie it was good to good to catch up uh and thanks for having me on thanks for joining me this week you can find out more about our guest in the show notes the music you're probably moving to by now is by Joe Mafia find him on Spotify that's Joe M-A-F-F-I-A and Rob Mackey is responsible for our visual design you can find him online by searching for Rob M-E-T-K-E Thanks, Rob. Let us know who you'd like to hear from or about your own experiences defining yourself outside of work at More Than Work Pod on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Give us a follow. Or visit our website at robbiasaid.com. Subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening to More Than Work. We'll be back next week with another guest. In the meantime, while being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.